be talking about uh, extending the uh, Jupiter kernel. Well, something's called Jupiter, the pronunciation is stuck in my head, sorry. But from what I understand, the, the right way to call it, pronounce it is Jupiter. Uh, the main message is uh, not necessarily the extending Jupiter itself, but the idea that interactive tools that we use and that we spend a lot of time in, uh, at least I cannot really code without having some kind of interactive prompt, whatever language I work in. Uh, if you just give me an editor and the terminal, but no, no good REPL, I'm like only half as productive. So we spend a lot of time in interactive tools and uh, it's uh, surprisingly easy to extend them and modify them. And uh, it's worth taking the effort. It's worth keeping the idea in your head that you can always uh, implement something uh, possibly very quickly, very quick and dirty, but already start getting some kind of uh, workflow improvement for your work. Uh, so I think more or less everybody is familiar with Jupiter, so I'll s somewhat skip uh, going into details, but uh, it's a notebook. Notebooks are a um, better kind of REPL invented, I believe, in uh, Mathematica in 1988. It's a document mixed with, uh, with examples of code and with their execution. Uh, at least the way it's done in Jupiter has uh, mm, there is a difference between the what you see in the document and the actual execution state because behind the scenes it's just an interpreter that is getting commands one after the other but the ability to go back in the document uh, okay so do you see the font should i make it larger larger let's see <laughs> okay uh, so here it says fingers equals two plus two, and here it out uses the fingers variable. Okay, first of all, I should have run the first, then the second. Okay, now if I edit this, and I execute this command, the variable changed, and what we see is an inconsistent state. Uh, it's something we have to keep in mind, is the flexibility is given to us as users to decide. If this buzzers us, we have a hint on the left side that you, if you see the... Earlier number is higher. That's a sign that this was evaluated out of order, and possibly if you rerun everything, you will not get uh, something might not work. So there is always a hammer of going to kernel, restart, and run all. And uh, and running everything from start. But sometimes, like if the execution is heavy, you might not want to do that. Uh, Okay, so if we, uh, the architecture of uh, Jupyter is that it supports many languages. The very name Jupyter is a rebranding of the previous name IPython to stress the fact that it supports Julia, Python, R, and uh, there is currently in the wiki contains more than 80, they call it kernels. It's back, in, uh, it's, I think it's a, it has nothing to do with operating system kernels. I think it's just a name for the stack since uh, Mathematica itself used it for uh, its own architecture to call it a kernel. But uh, a kernel is just a process that gets command to execute the uh, code and uh, some other features like completions that we'll see and uh, returns uh, results of execution. Uh, the browser is talking, there is a process uh, when you run Jupyter Notebook, it's a process that's talking uh, HTTP to the browser, and there's JavaScript in the browser, obviously. Uh, and it's talking a custom uh, protocol, not very complicated, JSON over zero MQ with uh, kernels. It's launching and killing the kernels itself. And I did kernel restart all, like I did before. It killed the process, uh, the IPython, uh, the actual kernel that knows how to execute Python code and started a new process, so we got a fresh uh, state. Mm. There are several ways to implement a new kernel, uh, and there are many examples for each of them. As I said, there are over 80 kernels, including several written specifically to be minimal examples of how you do it this way. So the first way you can do it in any programming language is to implement the protocol itself. Um, it's not very complicated, but um, 
also not very easy, but uh, if you're writing some other language like the Haskell kernel or the Julia kernel, I think many of these implement the protocols themselves. Uh, if you're uh, Uh, if you're writing in Python, which is what we are here for, uh, you can have uh, use the work done for you, uh, some of the work. Uh, you can reuse uh, use subclass a class, you implement a couple methods, do execute, do complete, do inspect, and you get a lot of uh, uh, work done for you. Uh, there is a way to reuse even more code um, functionality uh, in, uh, let's, uh, let's, do a live example where we add something. Okay, let's do time, uh, I don't know, tab plus two. It will not take a lot of time. Uh, this syntax with percent is not the Python syntax. This is what um, uh, Jupyter calls uh, magic. Uh, the Python kernel implements a lot of magics. Uh, they're divided into cell magics with 2% and line magics with 1%. Uh, in other languages, uh, you would have to implement them from scratch or not implement them. It's your choice what magics to implement. But uh, you can um, use there's a project called MetaKernel, which extracts this functionality from IPython. Uh, I'm not actually sure if it's a, IPython itself inherits from it or if it's separate forked uh, uh, machinery, but doesn't matter. You can subclass it and then you get access to a lot of these magics. For example, then your language will be able to run shell commands by typing a uh, 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 bang sign ls and I'm running a sh commands in shell without having to implement uh, the ability to shell out and do all kinds of things in every uh, language. So I think the third way is actually if you're going to for something that a lot of people will use, the third way is probably the most um, convenient but uh, I'll demonstrate the second because uh, um, it's slightly just less things going on uh, it was simpler to demonstrate so uh, for a first example uh, let's do um, somewhat silly thing it's something not it's not really a programming language but still it's something we sometimes find ourselves doing interactively a lot when working with HTTP APIs uh, we find ourselves uh, typing URL commands in the terminal fixing them tweaking them a little running them again so it sounds like something that might be suitable for uh, uh, for using a notebook for. Uh, so let's uh, s let's write something simple. Uh, okay, something that I wanted to do for this lecture but I didn't yet found out how is to develop the kernel itself inside the notebook so I can uh, ch change it live and uh, demonstrate it. I didn't find a good way to do it. Found like a half way. Uh, so it's more convenient for starters to implement to do the, some of the functionality just as a function like call it yourself in the notebook and play with it so uh, mm, I'm just using the re excellent request library I'm doing I, I, I'll implement a very simple syntax get and then the URL so I'm just splitting it I'm parsing uh, current time the support get also it's easy to support the other verbs uh, and I'm performing the request and I'm printing the status code, the headers, and the text. So let's use this function. And uh, I'm using the uh, localhost, uh, something uh, right on localhost to uh, so that I'm not uh, dependent on the Wi Fi. Uh, so, yes, we have the request uh, response code 200, we have the headers, we have uh, uh, the output. Uh, okay, so. Let's see what it takes to convert it to a very, very simple kernel uh, instead of just a function. Uh, this is a very quick and dirty way uh, to just uh, to register it. The correct way to implement it is a, mm, to connect the files to let Jupyter know how to run your code is to implement a Python uh, package. Uh, we set up Py, install it with pip, and uh, uh, the way you register it is actually by writing a small JSON file. Uh, here it is. Uh, this, by the way, when I the magic percent percent write file is uh, at this moment writing the content of this cell to this file, uh, and uh, the quick and dirty thing I did is just writing my 
it to, to, to a fixed path in TMP and referencing it. But the correct way is to use uh, to, to install it as a package. Uh, so it's a very simple uh, file. There is a, the command line that needed to launch the kernel and how it will be appearing in the UI. And um, I already did that. So we see HTTP kernel one here appearing in the menu uh, because I already did it before. Uh, you might have to restart the notebook server. I'm not sure. Uh, OK, so what does the code look like? Uh, we import a base class from the IPython code. Uh, there is some metadata here. This, all these are just uh, information. Some of this affects how it is uh, the code is syntax highlighted in the editor. Uh, but uh, basically, this is just metadata. Uh, and there is a main function that uh, you give. We give our class to it. Uh, so the, the bigger difference here is uh, the way we return responses. Uh, above, I just used print. Uh, but here, I need to return it, uh, a dictionary at the end, telling if the status was OK or not. And I'm not sending the results as part of the response at the end. Uh, the reason is that sometimes uh, computations can take a long time. So it support, uh, the protocol supports sending results in the middle. Uh, and self.stream here is a very simple function to uh, just a shorthand for the more verbose function returning a message of type stream with uh, name is td out and this text. OK, uh, let's see. OK, so this is a notebook whose kernel is a HTTP kernel. Uh, let me restart it. So I'm running the simpler version I just overwrote. OK, and it works. We get basically the same output on each uh, std out as we got there. OK, so how much time do I have? Uh, a few typical things you will want to take care of. Uh, if I, uh, What happens when you get errors? If I uh, request a page that doesn't exist, I get a 404 error. I sh maybe want to display it somehow in red as an error. Maybe I don't want the whole headers, etc., for uh, an error. If I have bad syntax and I run it, I get a... Mm, sorry. I get a very long and ugly traceback uh, going through the internals of my kernel. Now, this is something... I don't want the user to see because the error was not a bug in my code. The error was a result of a, it's an error in the level of the language I'm implementing. The language being the very simple language get and the URL. Uh, but I want to tell the user that his syntax is bad. I don't want him to uh, all my internals to leak. So uh, for the expected types of exceptions, like I'm only supporting get at this moment, so assertion error and the request exception, which is all kinds of HTTP errors. I'll catch them. And then if I do it, I'll get a, here I'm okay prototyping it with a print to STDR, which is automatically read in a, the notebook, but I'll do it with streaming to, through the stream response message uh, uh, if I do it in the kernel. So that's much nicer to the user uh, because doesn't see irrelevant details. He sees uh, details uh, on the lev level he's working with, which is this language. We can do fancier output. As we all know, uh, Jupyter supports graphs and graphics and uh, things. So uh, hmm. uh, there is a different message, display data. You give it a dictionary of several uh, MIME types. So we'll send the text HTML response. And now, if you go to this kernel and uh, we are started and we run it, we got our uh, response in a header. We got our headers uh, in a details tag, which can be collapsed. Uh, so they're there, but not as, as obstructive. Uh, it's easy to think of other uh, improvements. Uh, Another big thing we want in an uh, interactive environment is completions. Uh, this is getting sillier and sillier, but OK, how do we complete uh, HTTP URLs in uh, um, some ways that will usually work? 
in the different cases, whether we have a JSON API that might return us links to other URLs or we get an HTML response. So the most idiotic thing I implemented is just scrape the output without parsing it, without even knowing what language it is. Scrape for something that looks for URLs. And uh, so, okay, so I get some uh, completions, uh, but these are actually, if I go to the page which I'm uh, accessing, which is uh, printers administration, uh, which happens to work over HTTP, uh, I, there are many links here. Where are they? They are mostly relative links. So, okay, we'll do something a little dirtier, uh, but uh, better working. So remember, the idea is that we are not trying at the beginning immediately to get something that is very um, correct. We want to get something that helps us um, uh, that helps us uh, work, even if it's approximation, it's already a step forward. And uh, there is always a 10%, 90% rule. Uh, with a little work, we can get most of the way there. And then if we even like this uh, workflow, we probably will continue to iterate on it later. Uh, okay. Uh, I think the completions are currently broken in the kernel. Uh, See, that's in this box. Mm. But if I press tab, ah, sorry, uh, can't live them as a completions. But uh, the basic idea is simple. You add a yeah, this code is all wrong. You add a do complete method. Uh, you get the whole code as a string. You need to, uh, and you can decide the return the response includes. As the start and end uh, in characters of the part you are suggesting to replace, and the list of uh, strings uh, to display and uh, replace them. Uh, it worked in another instance. Um, another thing which led me to starting this language, another example uh, that I started to work with, it's very far from perfect yet, uh, but you can find it on uh, uh, my GitHub. I'll show the link at the end uh, with the lecture as soon as after the lecture there is good Wi-Fi I'll push it again and I'll keep improving it for uh, in the next few days to make it more organized so maybe wait a few days uh, is Ansible uh, Ansible is a Python uh, system that basically for configuration management basically it connects to multiple hosts uh, over SSH and uh, performs operations there it uses a semi-declarative syntax based on YAML. Uh, but when you write along as this Ansible script, is called a playbook. When you write along playbook and start to debug it, as any language, it's, it might be more, uh, I felt it might be more convenient to debug it um, interactively. Uh, there is actually an Ansible debugger they have. Uh, Ansible has very many extension points. There is an excellent blog post which helped me. Uh, like. My thoughts about the language were that the language itself in YAML, it's not such a good programming language. Uh, it obviously is a trade off they're trying to push people to be more declarative. And uh, uh, But when I really understood the idea behind it is when I look at all the um, over 10 different places in which you can plug new uh, things into the system. Uh, uh, and that uh, helped me understand uh, that it's not about the language itself, it's uh, the fact that the constraint allows you to have uh, many uh, things you can plug. So I don't have time to go really into the internals, but after stealing some code from the Ansible uh, command line uh, client, we can use the Ansible APIs to uh, instantiate a few classes and execute code. Uh, let's maybe do Here, okay, go to this work. Okay, I'll skip the live demo. Uh, okay, maybe I can show it working here. Uh, okay, so the truth is that it's only 
half working because out the commands do run. Uh, I'm able to execute ansible tasks, but uh, the output is not. I didn't uh, finish plugging the callbacks back from the ansible uh, to get the outputs and results of the execution to send them back uh, into uh, the notebook. Uh, they're going to part of them might be going to study out. Uh, one thing I didn't, I skipped with by skipping all the live demos is uh, looking the, the study out of the process uh, where we run uh, the kernel. Okay, so okay, I will not stop it now. But uh, or you know what, I'll stop it now. I'll run it again. So uh, we launch the notebook by running the Jupyter notebook server. Uh, and it opens, uh, it allows, opens a new browser tab. Uh, but this very console will show us also the tracebacks from any errors we make by uh, bugs we make in our, uh, that we didn't catch in our uh, kernel. So uh, here is an example. So if you, if you see during the execution, uh, you see, yeah. Uh, normally, when you run something, you see. Uh, uh, well, let me show it uh, here in the console. Uh, okay, normally there is. You see in. Uh, okay, this is maybe a good example. Uh, you see in square bracket thirty four. Uh, yeah. When when I press shift enter. Okay, now it's stuck because something uh, got broken. And that's actually good because that's exactly what I wanted to demonstrate. If you see in this star, that means it's still running. But while we are developing, that probably means we have a bug and uh, the something crashed. You will also see the kernel crashing and then again return to the console to find it. Uh, something I wanted to work on but didn't... Uh, since it's not fully working, I didn't get to play with this, uh, looking for solutions to it yet, is uh, the fact that uh, the statefulness of the system. This is something that actually I discovered is hard to do in Ansible Notebook. Sorry, in uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I want my code to, I want to solve this uh, fact that I can uh, execute, if I change something at the top of the notebook, the results at the bottom do not necessarily reflect it. That there is a single cumulative state that keeps changing as I run each command. I want to reset and go back and uh, start the uh, uh, role history back. While I'm developing scripts, I can actually do that if I use a virtual machine or a Docker container, so I can snapshot them and I control them back. This is something I want to uh, work on. Uh, but actually, Jupyter protocol doesn't uh, let you, doesn't give you any hints to the kernel about the fact that you are rerunning an old command. It's just, for the kernel, it's just yet another command. Uh, there is an extension that uh, it's uh, NB lineage, I found by someone that uh, it's uh, tr tr UIDs to each command and uh, you can get some knowledge about it, but I didn't have time to play with it yet. Uh, let's see what's... And, uh, oh, okay. I'll give one shout out to a uh, network. Yes. Not this one, a better way to code. Okay, so the creator of uh, one sentence, uh, two sentences. Uh, there are two, for this last problem I talked about, uh, there are two efforts that already did something very interesting. Uh, one is, uh, sorry, I forgot the name. Uh, there is, a, um, in JavaScript, there is an online uh, notebook that actually snapshots uh, uh, computer state every after every command, and when you go back, it restores. Uh, it's very nice. Another very promising thing that I saw recently by the creator of uh, D3, uh, D3.express, it's a it's a notebook, but it has some very novel, very interesting ideas about how to make things uh, more interactive. Uh, 
it uses uh, JavaScript, but uh, same ideas could be done in Python. Uh, it uses generators as a way to uh, create animations, and it uses it's more like again it solves the problem of the order by treating the code not as a sequence of commands, but as a spreadsheet. So it doesn't matter in which order you write it. You can define a variable later and refer to it before, and it will reevaluate things that depend on other things. So that's a very interesting project to keep an eye on. Uh, questions? Yes. Uh, so the kernel is a stateful process. As long as it runs, uh, presumably what we can implement whatever we want. But uh, basically, we wanted to keep states between cells. We want to be able to define variables in one uh, cell and uh, use them in another. Uh, in the case of HTTP, I uh, wanted, but didn't have time to show how I implement a shorthand when I can cd to a pass and then uh, my urls will be relative to it so that will be a instance variable on my kernel class uh, in the case of ansible there is a uh, big complex machinery in the ansible interpreter for calling states there is a variable name or manager object but it works if uh, at least in my experience i was able to uh, set variable in one uh, playbook and then access it from another 